that very early in the history of the universe, the universe was incredibly smooth. And we know this because of the microwave background radiation, which we see smoothly distributed around the skies. Now the problem then is there just isn't time for gravity to pull together lumps of matter to make galaxies. Now the way astronomers have solved this problem is by suggesting that a large fraction of the matter in the universe is in a completely different form, some dark, invisible form. This dark matter could have already started to aggregate together into lumps. So then when the universe had cooled down sufficiently for the ordinary matter to start to collect together under the effect of gravity, it would find these lumps already in place and start to fall towards them under the action of gravity. So this is how we think galaxies are made. There are several contexts in which evidence for dark matter arises. One context is when we study galaxies like our own Milky Way. The point is that the stars in a galaxy move around the center with a certain speed. And that speed tells us how much mass there is within the orbit of the star. Now, if the only matter in the galaxy were that invisible stars, one would expect this velocity to fall off as you go to greater distances from the center. In fact, what we find, both for our galaxy and most other spiral galaxies, is that the velocity seems to be constant. And this can only be explained if there is a, a dark halo which has more mass than the visible stars. In the autumn of 1981, Carlos Frank went to Berkeley to work with Mark Davis and Simon White on the possibility that the hidden mass might consist of one of these elementary particles, the neutrino. Neutrinos are fast-moving particles, sometimes known as hot dark matter. Using mathematical models, the group simulated the growth of galaxies and universes dominated by this matter. The preliminary results were extremely exciting. The predictions of what a neutrino-dominated universe would be like seem very close to the observational data. And we were very excited and wrote this very upbeat paper. We were just about to send this paper off when Mar one morning Mark Davis walks into my office and says, Carlos, I've been thinking about this problem. There's something not quite right. I smell a rat somewhere. And I said to Mark, look, Mark, we've been working on this paper for a long time. I'm sick and tired of it. We're sending it off now. But if you like, in order to cover your back and protect your prestige, we will add a sentence, a caveat, saying things look very promising, but there could be a snag. As it turned out, Carlos Frank was disappointed. Further work proved Davis to be right. Hot dark matter makes the clusters of galaxies far too big to match the observable universe. It was bad news. The other alternatives weren't as attractive as the already observed neutrinos. So if hot dark matter wasn't the answer, what was? 1984 was the year of cold dark matter. Cold dark matter does not suffer from the pitfalls of hot dark matter. And the reason for this is that the sequence in, in, in which structures form is exactly the opposite. In a cold dark matter universe, the first structures that form are fragments of galaxies, and these come together as a result of their mutual gravitational attraction and build up structures like galaxies and even larger structures like clusters and superclusters. How do we know this? Well, uh, the way to figure this evolution out is by carrying out embody simulations. These are very simple things. They're basically a mathematical model whereby one can calculate the distribution and the evolution of the distribution of mass in an expanding universe. As I have been talking, uh, we see here the result of one such computation. This is um, a simulation of a universe dominated by cold dark matter, and what one sees here are points, each of which represents a clump of cold dark matter. You can see how the particles tend to aggregate into clumps. That's just a result of gravita gravity uh, amplifying small little clumps by attracting more and more of the surrounding material. If we now look at this calculation at a slightly later time, the distribution of cold dark matter would look like this, with well-defined clumps and uh, regions of lower than average density that are to be identified with voids or holes in the distribution of galaxies. At last, an explanation for the formation of galaxies. And although 90% of the universe could still not be seen or even indirectly observed, we seem to have a coherent theory for everything that had happened since the Big Bang. 
COBE, or the Cosmic Background Explorer Telescope, was launched in November 1989. Its instruments make much finer measurements of the microwave background. The cold dark matter model predicts that the clumping together of dark matter in the early universe should have left faint temperature fluctuations. We are really looking for primordial fluctuations, fluctuations that were produced in the extremely early universe during the time of inflation by quantum mechanical processes. And those things have been frozen in until the time we're looking at. Because the universe is so transparent to microwaves, we can look back to a time that's only 100,000 years after the Big Bang. And as the data has been coming in, we've been processing it, checking and see it's okay, making maps. And the first map we make, you can see, it's just, just uniform. I mean, you just see the sky looks the same everywhere. You don't see the galaxy or any other things that you see optically. If you take away the average brightness and expand the scale by a factor of 1,000, then you see two things, the most prominent of which is that the radiation goes smoothly from a hot in one direction to cool in the other direction. And we think that's caused by our motion. The direction we're going, we're running into more photons, and it's hotter in the direction we're leaving, there are fewer. And the other thing you can see is a band across here, which is the galaxy. But if we take away the dipole anisotropy, which we see in the next picture, the only thing you see in the picture is the galaxy. And now we can see down at a level which is more than 10,000 times the original intensity, and we see that there are no fluctuations. And that's getting to be a problem. The story took another unexpected turn. The IRIS, or Infrared Astronomy Satellite, had been put into orbit in January 1983. It wasn't looking for large-scale structures. Its purpose was to make the first extraterrestrial infrared map of our own galaxy. IRIS was designed to make an infrared map of the sky at um, 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. Uh, this is the first uh, maps of the sky in the, infra in the infrared band. When we started to look at the data as it came in, we soon found that at 12 and 25 microns, most of the sources were stars, and that is what we'd been expecting. But at 60 microns, we found that many of the detections, these peaks on the detector output, were in fact galaxies. Some of them were fairly bright galaxies that were already in known catalogues of galaxies, but many of them were much fainter, more distant galaxies that had never been catalogued before. We then had this very exciting idea of turning this into a three-dimensional map of a, of a substantial volume of the universe by measuring uh, the redshifts and hence the distances of a, of a large sample of galaxies. In summer of 1987, a group of cosmologists converged at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge and uh, Michael Ron Robinson and I began to talk about the possibilities offered by the IRAS uh, survey of galaxies, which we were already working in. It, it became apparent very soon that this survey would provide us with a unique opportunity to carry out some very exciting tests. We, we realized we could use this survey to answer two questions. One, to estimate the mean density of the universe. Two, to provide a very stringent and critical test of the cold dark matter theory which already by then had been established as the standard model in cosmology. Our infrared survey could map a much larger fraction of the sky than previous optical surveys because optical light is absorbed by interstellar dust, the dust that's spread between the stars of the Milky Way. And also because Iris was so sensitive, we could map deeper than any previous large-scale survey. So we had this unique three-dimensional map of a large volume of the universe, 500 million light years in depth. And the question was, would the large-scale structures that we saw on this map of the real universe agree with the predictions of the cold dark matter model? The cold dark matter model matched the structures of nearby galaxies, but would it work for the larger scale structures seen by IRIS? We asked the program to tell us what we should expect to see in the QDOT survey if the universe was actually made out of cold dark matter. And what, we, what our computer program told us is that the galaxies should be distributed as shown here. The observer in this graph is located in the center. And what this shows is the expected distribution of galaxies in a sphere of radius 300 million light years across we would expect in a cold dark matter universe that most galaxies would be located in structures of this sort, superclusters with a rather blobby appearance, and forming a sort of wall of uh, galaxies 
surrounding the observer who is located in the center.